Good afternoon and welcome to the 18th annual exhibit of our group exhibit, Hydrogen and Fuel Cells. We've been here since 1995 discussing the most innovative technology on the market in energy. It is, of course, fuel cells. And uh, I would like to welcome you, uh, welcome our next guest on stage here. Please have a seat, of course. The drinks are on the house. We'll be serving coffee, tea, or whatever your heart desires. And welcome with me a fellow Canadian, uh, Eric Denhoff, who is president and CEO of Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. Welcome. Your microphone. Great to see you here. I have, of course, as a, a Canadian, uh, um, uh, 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 an interesting take on this. I always ask myself uh, why Canada, with a relatively small population and a relatively small economy, uh, has such a large contribution historically and even to this day in the fuel cell uh, market. Is there any explanation why Canadians are good at it? Well, I think we have a strong tradition in uh, science and technology, everything from Bombardier and aerospace to a strong auto manufacturing industry and nanotechnology, other areas. So I think it was quite natural, actually, that Canadians got involved in a leading edge technology like fuel cells. And in hydrogen, we're one of the world's largest producers of hydrogen. So mm -hmm. it was a pretty natural fit. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we're all interested in knowing something about the um, Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. What is this association? Why was it created? And what do you guys do there? So the association was very much like uh, ones you would find in other countries around the world. We were combined from Fuel Cells Canada, the organization looking after fuel cells, uh, investment and promotion with the Canadian Hydrogen Association, uh, three or four years ago into one pan-national association. We represent the interests of Canadian companies, uh, institutional research organizations and government agencies. They're involved in hydrogen and fuel cells. We mm -hmm. help promote the industry overseas and we help raise awareness and education in Canada about the sector and the uses of hydrogen and fuel cells. Is there any specific ratio between private sector and public sector? Is it largely yeah, private sector? Historically, Canada has been one of the biggest dollar investors in hydrogen and fuel cells. So in, in fuel cell technology in the last decade or a little longer, Canada's probably invested over a billion dollars in fuel cell technology research and development. And of that, 800 or 850 million dollars was private sector investment and about 150 to 200 million of government investment. So it is a very strongly driven uh, private sector initiative. It is, and for the size of the country, uh, you know, the United States DOE will spend about $100 million on, on hydrogen fuel cell research uh, and related research in the next year. Canada will spend probably at least $30 million of government investment in the same period of time with an economy a tenth the size. So we continue to punch beyond our weight in terms of both the state's investment in research and development and private investment. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the fields uh, you're involved in? We can talk about uh, uh, the eye catcher field. Everyone wants a fast and sexy car. We can talk about the standard uh, applications that are less um, apparent, uh, what happens indoors. Uh, what are your favorite um, uh, fields that you work in? Well, when we're talking to the general public, they want to see cars and airplanes and, uh, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think for uh, institutional people, uh, academics and, and research people and corporate uh, people, Canada has a series of products that are still world leading. So Germany will begin uh, selling commercial uh, quantities of cars in 2015. Where will the fuel cells come from that power those cars? They'll come from Canada. Of course. They're not being made in Stuttgart, they're being made in Vancouver in a brand new mm -hmm. 50 million euro production facility that's opening in Vancouver this July. Mm -hmm. For the airplane that's over here, uh, this fabulous uh, airplane that Germany's building and field testing now, the fuel cells come from Hydrogenics, a Canadian company whose booth is just over here. Mm -hmm. For hydrogen storage, where Germany and many other countries have huge uh, but unpredictable renewable supplies, and I think Germany last year spent 30 or 50 million euros on negative pricing, you know, to get other people to take the excess wind. Uh, companies like Hydrogenics have storage solutions. They've sold a one megawatt uh, electrolyzer to a German wind farm company to take off-peak wind, produce hydrogen, and inject it into the natural gas pipeline. Not a demonstration project, not a pre-commercial project, a commercial sale for commercial operation. So in buses, we still have the world's largest fleet of uh, zero-emission buses in Whistler in Canada, 20 buses that have done more than a million miles uh, of regular 
in transit commercial service, not a demonstration project, used every day, full shifts all day long, and they're absolutely fabulous buses. And they have Ballard fuel cells inside those buses and, and Ballard's boosts over here. Mm -hmm. And then we have companies like Next uh, Energy who are producing utility scale electrolyzers for, uh, for generation of hydrogen. And we have some quite intriguing products that are being produced in, uh, in the fuel cell area for backup power for telecom. After Katrina and mm -hmm. after Fukushima in Japan, people realized the batteries uh, backing up their cell phone towers for three hours weren't, weren't going to cut it. Weren't going to do and, it, yeah. And uh, <laughs> if you go to Indonesia right now, you'll see more than five or 600 Ballard fuel cell backup power units uh, all over Indonesia because the, the grid's very unstable mm -hmm. and the telecom system doesn't make any money if the, if the grid isn't working. And so they have, uh, by the end of this year, I think about 1,000 uh, backup power units in Indonesia, the second largest number outside the United States. Uh, so. For me, it's fascinating. That some of these uh, niche markets, we're talking about backup power here. And of course, um, uh, there's a sort of um, uh, subliminal psychological effect here. We're in Germany. The grid here is so reliable, you kind of forget that there should ever be something like black <laughs> backup power. There are certain regions in the world where that is not the case. Um, is this, when we're talking about backup power, is this something you can geographically locate? There are regions that simply are in need of uh, reliability, and the grid is not going to solve that issue. Yeah, of course, Germany has you know, one of the most reliable grids in the world. But nonetheless, actually, Germany pioneered backup power for use in, for example, data centers. People don't want to lose all of their important critical yep. city or emergency response data. So Meinigen in Germany has put in a fuel cell backup power system using a Canadian fuel cell. And we see in, in Scandinavian countries the use of uh, fuel cells for backup power for emergency response. Obviously, countries that are in Central or South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia, that are developing countries, have much more unstable grids. So you're going to see a greater use in those countries. But there are niche areas in Europe and North America uh, where clearly uh, fuel cells can, can serve an important purpose, and they do. Are there a number of factors involved? I'm, I'm still talking about this backup issue. We have had um, uh, isolated remote units that are fascinating for me because if they, are, uh, if they do require batteries, you have the issue of how long it takes to get there to replace the battery and then to go home, and who's the poor dude who's going to go there and then come back, uh, and is it more practicable to replace a battery with a limited lifetime with a battery and a larger supply of hydrogen. So are there niche markets developing there that uh, tend to focus on remote applications, yeah. stable backup in larger facilities? Yeah, and I'm not sure how much application they would have in Germany, but in Scandinavia perhaps, and certainly in other areas that have isolated communities where they're operating on diesel generation, very expensive to take diesel fuel in, barged or, or trucked in or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a number of projects in Canada, wind to hydrogen on isolated islands where otherwise they're using diesel, so it reduces greenhouse gas emissions, mm -hmm. provides a local grid reliability. We have a run of the river power project in a, in a remote community where the uh, run of river power isn't sufficient at peak, so they take off peak power, produce hydrogen, store it, feed it back into the grid through fuel cells. But Right mm -hmm. now, some of the most interesting applications are in defense. So you have these large northern bases. Mm -hmm. They're very isolated in Canada and the Arctic. This is true of other countries. And you have to ship in huge quantities of very expensive and polluting diesel fuel. And the work's underway now to investigate whether there's potential to use uh, hydrogen fuel cell uh, power as primary and backup power in those areas. Mm -hmm. uh, as a professional tree hugger, of course, I don't like the noise. Um, are there applications that specifically are used because, uh, let's face it, a diesel motor makes a lot of noise, not just smoke, and these uh, fuel cells are relatively, well, almost completely silent? Well, sure. I mean, there's a number of both industrial applications, like the use of uh, fuel cell zero emission forklifts in material handling, so Walmart, Mm -hmm. in Canada has converted their whole fleet over in Calgary and they have another one underway to zero emission forklifts. They get a 22% return on investment after one year or two years. They get lowered greenhouse gas emissions. They have more efficient production and it's cleaner. Now, mm -hmm. also if you're in, in Jakarta in Indonesia and you want backup power for your cell phone tower that's on top of an apartment building, you don't want a noisy diesel generator. If you're in a little village, you don't want to hear it going all night. So they're finding that there's very rapid deployment in those places, partly because of that. Mm -hmm. Easy maintenance, few moving parts, 
Less noisy, less polluting. Yeah. Uh, tanking up time is reduced. Yeah. The, the battery. Yeah. And these are now, you know, one of the things I noticed just coming into, into the job last year was there are a lot of pre-commercial products out there, but there now are a lot of commercial products. I mean, if Walmart and Coca-Cola and FedEx and all these companies are by the thousands converting over to material handling forklifts with fuel cells, there must be a reason. And they're doing it because in Canada, you don't even get a subsidy. So we have a purely commercial uh, forklift fleet deployment now happening mm -hmm. by people like Walmart who are cheap and careful with their money. They're not doing mm -hmm. it if they don't make money. Mm -hmm. And Ballard Power used to sell 100 or so of these units a year. They now sell 3,000 to 4,000 a year, and it's growing exponentially. So mm -hmm. some of the product lines now are well, well beyond you know, hydrogenics, electrolyzers. They've sold 1,500 or more around the world. Refueling stations, uh, renewable power to storage. Uh, some, some of these products are, are very commercial now. This is something you should almost not say in Europe. What? You do it without a subsidy? <laughs> yeah, this is a problem in Canada too because <laughs> I, I would like the government to give us money, but now that they know uh, that we can do it without money, no one will give us money, so it's a, it's a dilemma. Uh, but you seem to be doing well. Uh, there's uh, uh, two focal points that are really interesting uh, in transportation. It's the public transportation, and then it's, of course, everyone's dream. Uh, when is the automobile industry going to shift. Uh, you mentioned Whistler. They've got a wonderful um, uh, uh, project uh, there uh, with a record quantity of um, uh, miles driven by these vehicles. Uh, what about the automotive industry? Is there interest? Are Canadians ahead of the game on that field? Are the Europeans lagging behind? What is the sort of status of the car? Well, you know, Canadians are still ahead in some things behind the, the curtain, but Germany and Japan are, and Korea are the, are the car makers along with GM who are clearly ahead uh, in front of the curtain. So Germany will have the biggest rollout and the fastest rollout, and that's as it should be. You will have a huge number of refueling stations done. Uh, you have a, a relatively compact geography that supports it, huge infrastructure ability. So I guess in 2015 we will see significant fleets in Germany. Maybe a bit earlier Hyundai will put out a thousand cars into North America, mm. then Daimler and others into California. And in Vancouver, you know, we have the largest number of fueling stations in the country. We also have the largest or second largest in North America. We have a half dozen fueling stations already. So we hope we will be a candidate for after Germany and after California that people will then uh, deploy to Vancouver. We already have a significant experience operating small fleets, Ford Focuses, trucks, the buses. Mm -hmm. So we know what we're doing and we're a very progressive market. We're like California in a lot of ways early adopters of smart car kind of technology and, uh, and of electric cars and hybrids. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we think the cars will be here. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's lots of work to do, but they're coming. Mm -hmm. I should add that if anyone has a brief question from the audience, we do have time for a, a question or two. All you need to do is uh, raise your hand. Um, uh, I'm certainly full of questions. Uh, one of the questions we face in uh, Germany uh, is uh, obviously, uh, with the precarious energy situation. Germany does import almost 100% of its energy. Uh, so uh, there is an increasing focus on developing its own resources. They're largely renewables. We're talking about wind energy and solar. Uh, notoriously difficult to use because the demand does not run synchronously with uh, the supply. So that is the energy storage conundrum. Uh, how big a contribution can the Canadian uh, fuel cell industry uh, make to solving that issue of how are we going to store up to a terabyte of uh, energy um, uh, coming from renewable sources? Well, Canada is a very small player in a very big issue. You know, energy storage for Germany, and not just for Germany, for many other countries, is a huge issue. Uh, Canada has a great product. We have a, a large utility scale electrolyzer uh, from Hydrogenics that's already got a one megawatt installation for taking wind power off peak, converting it to hydrogen, and injecting it into a natural storage mechanism. Don't wait for big caves, don't wait for giant tanks. They're gonna in inject it into the natural gas pipeline. And I suppose you could go up to, I'm not the scientist, 10% or 15%. And Next Energy has a product as well to uh, a large electrolyzer utility grade, so or scale. So, Germany has a big problem, and they always are asking me questions about, well, how real is, uh, is the electrolyzer? How large can it be deployed? How much can it do? 
And my answer is, yeah, there's always some questions, but look, for God's sakes, you're relying on your natural gas from Russia. You're paying a huge premium for it. You have the most unreliable of partners to supply your fuel, surely taking off-peak wind power and putting it in to replace expensive, unreliable imported natural gas at up to 10% from wind that you're now spending 30 or 40, 50 million euros a year for negative pricing, there should be some solution there. And you don't have to take it from me, the wind farms in Germany are starting to buy the Canadian product for exactly that purpose. But, you know, people are very odd. People would rather spend large amounts of money in sending their money overseas, the Americans to the unstable Mideast, Germany to the unstable Russia, than concentrating on taking your own renewable clean power, putting it into hydrogen, and then into the natural gas pipeline, or into storage, and feeding it back into the grid. So it's happening already. Germany is very progressive. Germany has a big problem, and they know it. And they're moving very rapidly in that direction. Canada just has a teeny little piece you know, to support of this problem, one, one technology, but an mm -hmm. important one. But we feel very strongly that we have a great partnership over 30 or 40 years, at least, with Germany on hydrogen and fuel cell development, and nothing's going to change there. We'll continue to be very strong partners. Yeah. Uh, Eric Denhoff, I thank you very much for that comment, because of course, I'm not at liberty to say all that in one <laughs> mouthful, and it was perfectly expressed. There are issues, all European countries face them, among them particularly Germany, and the Canadian uh, Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Association is working to solve them. It's been a pleasure talking to Thanks you, Eric. Very much. I hope you'll all come to the World Hydrogen Energy Conference in Toronto in June. It's the largest. You hosted it in Germany uh, in 2010. We had uh, a record number of 850 abstracts, 55 countries, and uh, 12 to 1,500 delegates uh, will be there. And uh, we're still trying to get the airplane. You could help lobby to get the airplane over to Canada, <laughs> but we have the cars. Yeah. Thank we'll you very fly much. it over. Yeah, Eric, a pleasure talking to you. I hope you'll be back next year. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eric. And thank you very much for your kind attention. We'll be continuing in about 35 seconds upstage. Next is uh, renewable fuels from CO2 and water. We'll be talking to Bjorn Eric Mai from Staxera and Sunfire. Have a seat, have a drink on the house, and be ready for some interesting information. Thank you very much. <laughs>